Welcome to the HR Think Tank, a podcast that uncovers the power a trusted workforce has on team performance, culture and morale. We gather insights from experts, business leaders and HR professionals to help you lead your team. Here's your host, Kai no, CEO and co-founder of Verify Now. Fraud can occur in any workplace, large and small. It can have serious and potentially lethal consequences for the organisation. The reputational damage can impact trust and how your employees, customers, suppliers, regulatory bodies and the broader community view your organisation. On today's episode, we chat with an expert about fraud in the workplace, the warning signs to look out for, the impacts, preventative measures you can take and the trends for the future. Our guest is Cam Jackson. He is partner and the Asia Pacific leader for claims and disputes, forensic and integrity services at Ernst & Young. Cam has over 25 years professional services experience across multiple industries and is a chartered accountant and forensic specialist by background. He has led significant engagements across the commercial claims, disputes and complex investigations and has worked extensively in a number of locations including the US, UK, Europe and Asia Pacific. In 2017, he was recognised as the Fraud Investigator of the Year in Australia. Welcome to the show, Cam. Thanks, Kai. Great to be here. So you've been a chartered accountant and forensic specialist uh, by background for the last 25 years. You've been involved in all aspects, including audits, investigations, prosecutions, advising boards and senior management, and now leading the team at EY for Asia Pacific um, in this space. What's kept you dedicated to this profession? I think it's just the excitement. Um, if you're going to do any accounting, forensic accounting and investigations is is the one for me. Uh, no two days are the same and no two jobs are the same. So it keeps things fresh and there's always things to learn and new experiences to be had. And and for someone who's maybe in, in uni or, or thinking about their course selection at the moment, um, what would you say to, to the people considering this profession, you know, um, why should they consider it and what are the key skills they need to succeed uh, in this space? I think the, the why is the, the, the constant journey for your career path that your skills will, will be growing incrementally job by job. Uh, forensic accounting is not something that you learn in a textbook. You learn it at the coalface and the more experience you get, the more opportunities you get. So it becomes a, a natural cycle that your experience leads you into other jobs and, and opportunities. I think it's it's the, the ability, though, to work with diverse people from different backgrounds across the globe. And sure, we're in a pandemic at the moment, so everything is, is on Teams or virtual, but certainly when things open up, if the past is anything to go by into the future, it's given me the opportunity to travel the world. And for a young professional starting out, uh, that's pretty appealing. I get more enjoyment watching graduates out of university, you know, six weeks ago they were doing exams, then fast forward six weeks they're sitting on a plane connecting on a flight in Dubai through to some place of the world that they've never been to or have actually just dusted off their passport for the first time and, and had the ability to work overseas. Um, the, the second reason would be the variety. There are so many skills that you pick up, whether it be IT skills, presentation skills, interview skills, uh, accounting analysis skills. The, the world really is your oyster to find your niche and find your passion and find those opportunities that are going to give you the opportunity to to explore where you want your career to actually go. But the foundation is built over many years and the forensic area just gives you that opportunity. And by the sounds of it, there, there's some other perks, obviously when travel can resume again, is travelling to different destinations and being able to do your work and meet people from you know anywhere Actually, so yeah, it's that's it's really important to me, and it's actually really important to my kids. Um, one of the sacrifices of the job, the more senior you become, is obviously travel and, mm. and missing family and kids, which is is truly important to me. But to to share with the kids a map of the world wherever I go away, when the travel's quite heavy, we put a little star on on the place that I'm going, and the kids follow it through. Yeah, and the nature of the work is to to countries and places that you would never go to. Um, and you probably wouldn't even know they existed yeah. unless you went there for a specific reason. So that keeps it exciting, um, but it certainly keeps me fresh in, in my outlook and, and the experience I get from from the diversity of people, cultures and places to, to make me a better professional. Because when you started, did you see your career path going this this way? No, absolutely not. I uh, I, I finished my final, final year at school um, many, many years ago. We, I just... Uh, 
had virtually our 30 year reunion, which was quite depressing in itself. That it shows how long out I've been, but I finished school and I didn't know what I actually wanted to do. Um, surprisingly, I, I did um, uh, quite well, uh, probably better than, than expected. And the only thing I could keep going back to was my accounting teacher, um, who, I, who I enjoyed his interaction. I enjoyed accounting, but to be honest, I didn't really enjoy the academic side of school. I was more interested in the sports side of school. I was lucky enough to to get a job at, at one of the big firms, being Coopers and Lybrand at the time, who merged in now with, with PricewaterhouseCoopers, and started in audit. And to be honest, what a great grounding for the first three years that I didn't actually know what an accountant did or what a general ledger was, even though I left with a full accounting degree. Uh, now, I'm sure, I'm putting a bit of ice on that one, yeah. but it's a great grounding. So I did audit, and then, to be frank, I needed more in my life, and I went to Arthur Anderson and joined the startup of their forensic accounting practice here in Australia, and that was it. I was hooked from day one. It was re uh, re refreshing for me. Hmm. It was it was like a drug, and I was hooked straight away. Yeah. Well, look on on the show today. You know, we're we're primarily going to talk about fraud in the workplace, but I know you've got some great um, cases and investigations that you can share w with us as well. So I'm really look looking forward to that. Uh, let's let's start first with fraud in the workplace. You know, uh, the, the definition of fraud refers to the deception that is intentionally caused by an employee or organisation for personal gain. What are the common types of fraud in the workplace? Sure. I think I think at a headline level, you know, you're often asked as a, a forensic accountant what, what the definition of fraud actually is, mm. and there's the academic view, and then there's the view in reality. Yeah. And to me, f fraud is just a line, and you either step over it or you don't. If you step over it, you know it's wrong, you know it's incongruent to what's actually expected, and it will bring some form of unease that something's not quite right, and the gut feel of it would be indicative of, you know, a, a bad event that goes against the grain on, on what you should actually be doing. So I wouldn't get caught up on the definition of fraud. It's just knowing right from wrong and there's a line. And once you cross it, you never come back to the other side. Hmm. So it's important to stay on the right side. And if hmm. in doubt, stay on the right side. Um, fraud in the workplace, uh, I, I think, can be split into three main areas. The first would just be corruption itself. Um, which would involve, you know, conflict of interest, breaches, bribery, um, you know, financial advantage um, through 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 illegal means um, and the like. And corruption is, is certainly uh, more prevalent offshore, outside of Australia, but Australia is not immune. There's there's a lot of well documented cases uh, of corruption within within Australia. The second and most common would be asset misappropriation. And that's simply just stealing things of value. So whether it be, you know, stealing um, tyres from a warehouse mm. from your employer, stealing stuff from the stationery cabinet, um, you know, skimming funds from petty cash, ordering things through accounts payable, taking something of value that's just clear stealing. Uh, in the third area, and I think, you know, the most devastating area is, is financial statement fraud where the accounting or the financial statements of an organisation are compromised deliberately for an outcome to show a better result, to hide things, to portray a different view to the market um, and to keep the story going on, on good news because no one likes bad news, hmm. um, manipulating deliberately the, the results of the entity. And all three delve and cascade down into particular areas um, of an organisation, whether it be HR, whether it be sales, whether it be finance, whether it be legal, with different schemes and events that that underpin the types of frauds that fraud that exists. Okay, and and in terms of the sources of fraud, as in you know where where it's coming from, who are these perpetrators? Is it internal? Right is it external? Your, it's everywhere. It's right under your nose, and it happens in every single organisation. So let's let's be realistic on that. Fraud is happening everywhere within your organisation hmm. right now as you're listening to this, right? Um, it's human nature that fraudsters exist and will continue to exist. Where does it come from? It comes from your employees first and foremost, that uh, they seize the opportunity um, in terms of 
driving an outcome that's going to suit them, that will go against the culture and values of the organisation. But they're in your organisation inside the tent and know where to pull the levers um, and to expose the cracks and, and deliver what they want to achieve. Secondly, it's external, and external could be anyone. It can be a supplier. It can be a member of the public. It can be a government official. Um, it, it can be any counterparty within the operation. So, again, if you think about it, if it's happening in every organisation, every new individual that you introduce to the organisation just increases the risk and the prevalence that's going to exist. So in short, Kai, it, it happens everywhere from yeah. everyone. Yep, yep. And, you know, as as a company that provides um, specialised employment screening services uh, and HR services, this is obviously something that's at the front of mind for our clients, uh, and that's why clients have engaged in our services. But it's not always uh, the only thing that we push. Obviously, we strongly encourage our clients to use our services to find the right candidate rather than just focusing on blocking out you know, these, these unsavory candidates. Um, yeah. Look, over the last 18 months, we've seen a, a significant shift in terms of employment arrangements. You know, we've seen a, a significant introduction of remote work and also hybrid work models. Um, how do you see this affecting fraud in the workplace? Yeah, it's a, it's a very topical issue at the moment with everyone working from home and certainly our clients are asking what's going to happen, what should we be doing, and, and how can we mitigate that risk? Uh, I think a couple of observations there, Kai, is when people aren't physically together, you run the risk that they become disconnected from the culture of the organisation. Mm. They're floating on their own without the support mechanisms, and that's a dangerous thing, that their rationale and their mindset can change, that A, you won't see it, and B, it might just deteriorate into something to, to prompt them to do something that they shouldn't be doing. Secondly, um, the mindset set will shift because of uncertainty of the future or viability of their employment. Uh, the fact that they may not be receiving a bonus in the future because, you know, 50% of the revenue's gone yeah. uh, or, or some tailwind they're facing that's going to impact them on them personally can drive the mind to do silly things, to start thinking about where they can recover or, or claw back and justify fraudulent things in, in, in their own mind. Thirdly would be the technology aspect. Uh, I'm sure we'll touch on cyber, very topical. <laughs> right? Everyone's at home using BYD devices uh, on, on an internet, intranet, going through servers to the workplace without VPNs. Uh, everyone's there fishing for information, watching, mm. monitoring, ready to pounce, and then throwing home schooling with kids, clicking on websites left, right and centre. It's actually the perfect storm for, for cyber criminals to, to step into your home environment and then into your work environment. So out of sight, out of mind, and a breakdown of control that's, that's actually there. And then finally, I'd just say on the, on the proactive, you know, pre prevention and detection of, of fraud or malfeasance is it's very hard to review and monitor and test and check when people are working remotely. Yeah. The obvious telltale signs that might be there, some red flags, markers, whatever you may call them. Um, that's very hard when people are working remotely and you don't have that interaction mm. to check on well-being, state of mind, and where they're actually at and how they're actually tracking. Okay, so Cam, I've got a question that's probably more relevant to our publicly listed companies, but what is a short seller attack and how real is that risk? Yeah, a short seller attack is is effectively a report uh, that is made publicly available from an activist or a hedge fund that criticises the financial and non-financial reporting of an organisation. And it tries to call out where issues uh, exist, where fraud has occurred or where there's false information um, that's been covered up by the, co by the company or the organisation. And their only motive is to put that out there in the public domain so everyone panics and it drives the share price down um, because the market will react to, you know, a, an unexpected fact pattern or allegation or an emphasised allegation that, that may be out there. And, you know, credible short sellers have a role to play to keep the market honest and get the mistruths out there. And if organisations have got, you know, mistruth, that should be exposed and, and that's a good thing. Quite often, though, the short sellers can say whatever they like, whether it's true or not, so it has a catastrophic impact on, on organisations uh, and it's not a level playing field. 
boards of listed companies have an obligation to tell the truth in a timely manner through continuous disclosure, whereas short sellers can say whatever they like, even if it's not true. So it's a mismatch and a disconnect, and it can be catastrophic for an organisation in terms of value. And and if anyone wants to learn more, you've written a couple of articles about it on your LinkedIn, so certainly they can follow you or connect with you on LinkedIn and and read those articles for themselves. Well, uh, uh, let's let's dive into this a little bit more before we we shift to um, cybercrime because I know that is a topic uh, that is that is growing. Um, so it's good to talk about. But in terms of fraud, you know, let's talk about the warning signs. Um, you constantly hear about the fraud triangle. Can you help us understand the fraud triangle and then talk to us a little bit more about the warning signs in the traditional sense and also yeah. in today's today's situation? So I'll start with the fraud triangle and, you know, the ACFE or the, the Certified Fraud Examiner's organisation um, produced the fraud triangle that's a generally accepted methodology around fraud. fraud. Mm. And it's it's got three components to it, pressure, opportunity, and rationalisation. And all three are common in a, in a fraudulent event. Starting with pressure, um, it, that's effectively the, the warning signs that something's not actually quite right or there's some underlying reason that's driving the anticipation of committing a fraudulent event. Okay. And that might be greed, it might be substance abuse, it might be gambling, uh, it, it, it might be job loss. I've, I've seen fraudsters that have lost their job and haven't had the courage to tell their family they've lost the job. Mm. So I've had to you know, steal money to, to supplement their income. It can be ego and status that everyone wants to be seen to be successful uh, and achieving and getting ahead. So it's the pressure to keep the story going that's critical or, or, or embedded at the start of any fraud. The second element is the opportunity. And you know, fraud just doesn't happen. You've got to give the frauds to the opportunity mm. to do it. And I call that giving them the keys to the castle. And that's as simple as you know, not having an appropriate control environment within your organization. So you're just inviting trouble. Fraudsters will find a weakness or find a key to a door and walk through it because you left the door open or unlocked. And if you don't have the controls and the monitoring there, mm. you're inviting them to, to cause trouble. Secondly, it might be the cohort of employees that you have. They're just not the right employees to have. You, you're not hiring good people mm. that have got a history of fraudulent events, that have got a history of you know adverse findings that are publicly available that had you have known, you probably wouldn't have them in your organisation. Thirdly, it's uh, the relationships you have with your suppliers and your customers if you've got bad customers and bad supplies, again, you're just inviting a whole lot of trouble and it's the perfect yeah. storm. So the opportunity is there for the fraudulent event. Yeah. The third area, and, and this is this is where I think the fraud triangle has to evolve to, is, is what they call rationalisation. Mm. And that really goes to the heart of culture within an organisation, how people actually justify what they're actually doing or rationalise what they're actually doing that they know is is wrong. So, you know... The company deserved it, so I will take that. Mm. Um, they did the wrong thing by me. I'm going to do the wrong thing by them. Yeah. Uh, I, I'm trying to protect my job, so I will fudge the numbers in the financial statements or I will hide something for management because I'm doing the right thing by the company. Even though I mightn't get something from it, it will keep my job safe and it might even lead to a bonus. Uh, commonly, I started and I just couldn't stop, but I always intended on paying the money back. So if I just take $1,000 from accounts payable and I'll put it back next month, it doesn't matter. It's a loan. You know, I've been here for a long time. But unfortunately, in my experience, you go one month, two months, three months, four months, and it gets bigger, 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 bigger. And, you know, once you tell a lie, it's hard to keep the lie going. So the story's got to keep playing. And then in certain parts of, of the world, and less so more now, uh, you know, I hear everyone's doing it, so I did it too. And you know, that's a cop-out. That doesn't make it right. That's just rationalising it that you're going to follow everyone else, but it goes back to your employees. If all your employees mm. are doing it, you're doing it too. Um, and a lot of the fraud work that we see when you look back historically, the event or the scheme is handed down from employee to employee and it just gets tighter and better and bigger in terms of what they're actually doing and the knowledge that they're so, actually so sharing. It's, so it's not... Um to just one person. You're saying there's others involved and others know about. Absolutely. Absolutely. And in this day and age with internal controls the way that they are yeah. um, and the amount of money that's spent on detection, testing, et cetera, 
controls are only as good as as the way that they're enforced. And the minute you take a shortcut, the control falls over and management override or employee override mm. steps in. So a com common one um, or, or best example on that would just be sharing of passwords, right? If I meant to have a, a password or two-factor identification for a bank account, mm. but I say, look, I'm busy, here's my password, go for it. Just, just log on for me. The control's broken down. You're opening the door and providing the opportunity for the fraud to happen. The pressure kicks in that I need the money and the rationalisation. Well, no one's going to yeah. know. They gave you the password. Let's get on with it. Okay. Well, let's let's talk about um, the consequences and what happens after fraud is committed, fraud is uncovered. Um, I, I want to start by asking you how much damage can fraud cause an organisation? And, and are there impacts beyond the financial aspects? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I don't operate in a, in a good environment because I'm there to find, to investigate fraud. So I know that something's happened and there are consequences that flow every day and we see every day. Um, there is the financial consequences, sure, but big organisations can get over losing a million dollars. Now, that might say, sound blasé, but, you know, they would expect to have a certain amount of leakage so that, that, that their expectations are, are met. But the real loss is the loss of reputation and the impact mm. on, on share price, the impact on the reputation of the board and directors and employees, the impact on lost customers, the impact on, excuse me, your, your talent pool, et cetera, et cetera. So it's got knock-on effects that, that go far and, and wide. Secondly, it's the distraction to the organisation. Whenever there's a big issue, everyone loses their mind. I'm being quite flippant to set the example. Yeah. But it is a big distraction, right? Everyone's looking at one another. Was it them? Was it them? Who was involved? You know, I, I need to check my email. I need to do this. And it's very important that the response to the issue is as complete and thorough as the issue itself because a lot of organisations are judged on how they respond mm. and the quality of the investigation rather than the event, the event it's, itself. Yeah. And if I use an example of, you know, a, a large US entity, just for illustrative purposes for, for your audience, often the penalties that come from corruption and fraud and events can be a lot higher in terms of the transparency of the fraud and the investigation that was conducted, i.e., did they have the right accounts in place? Um, were they recording things correctly? Did they have a thorough investigation process that was objective and independent? where they've been wrapped on the knuckles and fined there procedurally and there's been less importance on the actual event itself. Yep. And for any organisation out there, if we accept, and I'll convince everyone, which people don't get it, but yeah. they eventually get it when they say you were right, yeah. it happened, how you're going to respond to it when it does happen is the key to good management, that you have an independent team auditing or, or reviewing and, and investigating you protect the employees that have come forward and have a plan and a triage for that. You make sure that you're not investigating yourself. So the finance department isn't investigating the finance department, the legal department isn't investigating the legal part mm -hmm. department and so forth. And really having a thorough and sound process there to get to the bottom of it without fear or favour and accepting the results that come. And often that's more important than the issue itself. Yeah. No, that's that's great. I, I was actually going to going to ask this, this particular question, and you've already given us some of that insight, but say I'm an individual in an organisation and, you know, I've uncovered what I think are instances of fraudulent activity. Yeah. What are, what are the steps that I should be taking to ensure this is, this is um, investigated appropriately and, and you know, it's, it's uncovered and the responsible people are found? What, what are the key steps? So... Key, key steps are if you think something is wrong, it probably is wrong. So follow your gut instinct because in my experience, you can see the fingerprints on the issue. It's whether you can follow it through mm. and, and push it to the right people and the right organisation to see it through. And I often say to, to employees, you know, if you observe or see something, the standard you walk past is the standard you accept. So you have an obligation to report that in a truthful and factual manner, then you cannot be, be criticised and you'll always be protected. And there are whistleblower protection laws in Australia to assist people in making dis protected disclosures or informing of information that requires investigation. Secondly, 
there's a raft of mechanisms to, to report anonymously. You can do it via hotline. Mm. You can do it by an email to the ethics officer or the general counsel or the CEO or the CFO. Put it in writing, put it out there and be very factual and engage in the process to give them the, the, the information that's required. But often there's a line between a grudge, someone with an axe to grind, okay. and the allegations will be oh. false, hmm. to a line where the allegations will clearly be true. And regardless of what it is, the personal impact, toll and stress you see on the employees cannot be underestimated. Yeah. Right. If they've got an axe to grind, they're fixated on it. They just want to bury everyone. It goes very wide between fraud, bullying, harassment, misconduct, whatever it might be, to actually knowing something that's occurred that they feel, you know, grossly aggrieved of what's happened and disconnect from the organisation yeah. that how could that happen here and who's going to step in and actually take it up. You know, you've given us some examples already and you've touched on some real life ones. Can you can you share whatever you can, um, some real cases of fraud or investigations that you've done and talk to us about the fallout um, from it as well. Look, I'm, I'm certainly not going to uh, be explicit in, in naming individuals and, and companies and anyone who does their research will, will join the dots and I'll leave that to them if they have an interest in it. But the thing about fraud is it, it does become public and it becomes public very quickly mm. because of social media and the court reporting process. And Often I'll take an investigation from working out who did what and how, and I might work on a substantive matter for a period of months that culminates in a report to the police uh, or the authorities or the regulator that culminates in a court case, whether it be a prosecution, a civil trial, um, or, or some form of, of regulatory enforcement. Some of the common ones that, that stick with me are, you know, a very large financing um, invoice financing scheme, uh, IT company, um, startup company, great growth, great aspirations, and unfortunately didn't have the processes in place to have the checks and balances to, to understand what was going on. Invoice financing is simply you provide an invoice for, say, $1,000 to a, to a bank, mm. and the bank will pay you 90% of, of that invoice and then keep 10% margin and pay that at a later stage. The issue was that they ran out of money, the organisation, and they kept recycling the same invoices that had already been financed or created false invoices for financing. Uh, and it was very, very messy, very complicated, large mm. sums of money wow. involved into the millions. Um, very credible people involved within the organisation publicly, but unfortunately it culminated in a court case and the perpetrators of that um, served a custodial sentence for a number of years based on the financial advantage by deception they had obtained. And I think it's important, whilst I'm not a, a lawyer, when the fraudsters cut information, create information, mm. that's what they term as a count. Yeah. And in criminal proceedings, the more counts you have, the greater the scale you go up in terms of the length of incarceration you might actually receive. Yeah. So our work becomes very important in quantifying all of the fake documents and all of that. So the company went into receivership and was, was liquidated um, because private company can't sustain that. Customers don't want to deal with it. And key personnel um, are obviously no longer there mm. because it's been, been disbanded. Okay. Now, um, it happens. Mm. And, you know, if it can happen to large banks, it, it can happen to anyone. Uh, but again, it's a sophisticated steam scheme. Yeah. Happened over many years. Once it started, it doesn't stop, etc. Okay. So we've talked about you know the the risks, the red flags, the consequences of fraud. And I have to say, sitting here, I'm thinking, oh, you know, I'm getting I'm getting quite sweaty just trying to make sure I've got all the controls. Um, so for our listeners, can you give us some tips on some good fraud prevention practices for our Australian sure. businesses? Because um, you said fraud is everywhere. Uh, and, and no organisation is immune to this. So what, what proactive and reactive measures um, can organisations put in place? Sure. Um, so I think, I think that these examples are equally applicable for a startup, small, not-for-profit, right through to a top five ASX listed company within Australia. Um, 
first would be, uh, and, and I have a saying, you know, profit from the misfortune of others. And, and by that, I mean, learn the lessons as to what's happening within your peers, whether you're a charity, whether you're a listed company, because if it's happening over there, it's probably happening here. Hmm. And fraudsters follow organisations within their cohort or schemes replicate through different industries at different times because they know they can do it there, so they'll try and do it here and they'll try and do it there. So really keep abreast of what is going on mm. and do the cross-check. It Could it be happening here and why not? Why couldn't it be happening here? Secondly is around culture, and we've spoken a lot about tone from the top, and I also want to, want to focus on tone from the bottom. Yep. Give your employees the opportunity to engage in that process and break down the barriers there and have a holistic discussion. That can be through, you know, um, doing fraud risk assessments and where vulnerability may actually exist. It could be as simple as planning for a fraud to happen as to how it would be investigated and who would do what. Uh, it can be as simple as engaging with your employees on a survey. Have you ever been asked to do anything that's made you feel uncomfortable in the last two years? Have you ever felt pressure to implement a certain transaction or do something that goes against your principles or, or culture? If you don't ask, you don't get. Mm. Normally when you ask, you'll get something. You're not on a witch hunt or a fishing yeah. expedition, yeah. but you're engaging with your employees that you actually care. Thirdly is around training, and training is both proactive around what your expectations are. If you're a small organisation, it might be, you know, these are our five values and purpose. Is that all understood? And give examples and really just push it, push it, push it. So everyone's got that coming through the company DNA mm. uh, and working to the same standard. But then on the other side is the response side of uh, case studies. When things do go wrong, and they will go wrong, how did it happen? Mm. What happened? How did we find it? What was the impact on the individual and the company? And how was it actually resolved? It reinforces the company's attitude and responsiveness to, to various issues. Next would have to be data. And we live in an electronic world now. And, you know, that's, that makes me feel really old when I think about computers weren't there. When I started in forensic accounting, all of it was manual yeah. predominantly. Then we moved to electronic. So every transaction can be pulled out of the cloud or wherever it may be. All of the banking is electronic now. Mm. So there's counterparty transactions. Everyone uses email. So as soon as you touch a keyboard, it's there forever, whether you like it or not. And there's a thing called social media that people post things that give the greatest clues of all time as to what's going on, yep. that I can look what you're up to, Kai. Yep. I can tell where you are today. Yeah, yeah. I can tell what you had for dinner last night and I know who your friends are, right? Yep. Use the smarts that are there because that will give you the markers of where the action actually is and what issues you may actually have. And that can be, you know, for our smaller organisations that don't have unlimited budget, yep. Just doing the basics with data around matching, you know, your employee payroll bank accounts to your accounts payable bank accounts. The bank accounts you're paying your suppliers with to the bank accounts you're paying your employees with. And if I could tell you that you're paying an employee to a Commonwealth bank account, one, two, three, and you're paying a supply to the same bank account, Commonwealth, one, two, three, I reckon you'd work out you got a problem pretty quickly. Yeah. And you'd be surprised how often that happens that leads to a greater issue that's actually there. So harness the data that's in front of you to help detect fraud and, and prevent fraud. Yeah. We talked about cybercrime earlier. You know, uh, there was a report from the Australian Institute of Criminology that in 2019, um, it, the total economic impact was about $3.5 billion. And that includes, uh, you know, money that was lost directly by the victims, uh, includes money spent on dealing with the consequences for the victims, but also money spent on the prevention costs. Um, what do you see as the risk of cybercrime, particularly now as we do have a growing workforce, you know, working from home and, and having alternative arrangements to, to just work in the office? Yeah, yeah. C cyber is the future of fraud, whether we, we like it or not. If I can extract hundreds of millions of dollars by sitting in my living room anywhere around the world, what a great work environment for a criminal. Right. And that's the reality of it. Everything is electronic now. And as soon as, uh, you know, you, you put a patch in or a control in, the cyber criminals just get over the top of it, share the information, and you're unprotected. And I, I say it generally when people talk about cybercrime, if, you know, large financial institutions and organisations can spend hundreds of, million hundreds of millions of dollars on detection, 
why does it keep happening? And that's because the cyber criminals are ahead of the game yeah. and have got the upper hand. Highly and motivated becoming... as well, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, we, we do a lot of cyber work that we've got a team of cyber professionals that, that astound me when they reconstruct what have happened, the entry points, the threat actors that have been in the environment. You know, right to the point, Kai, that, you know, you used to say when someone wants to change the bank account, with an email, make make sure you phone the employee, the customer, et cetera, and, and validate it through voice. Mm. The cyber criminals get in now and can mimic your voice so they can take that phone call and orchestrate it back. Yep. Secondly, they can access the CEO's diary and know that she's on a plane between Melbourne and Perth, sends an email at the right time to the PA just before boarding and says, I'm about to jump on the plane, transfer this to that or get someone to do that. You've got the whole organisation at your fingertips. And it happens all the time. Yeah, yeah, and that's why you've you've got to you know invest in these areas because when it does yeah. happen, uh, it can take. Uh, it's not only a big distraction, but there will be some serious financial consequences Absolutely. for your organisation too. Um, so, and it's evol yeah. it's evolving, Kai, in terms of beyond just taking money through cybercrime. It's going to ransom to yeah. privacy of information and leaking information on the dark dark web, unless you pay X million to us we will release your records of every customer into the dark web. And once it's gone, it's gone. And that's happening more and more often that ransomware is, is, is becoming the, the yeah. main game. One, one of the last questions we've got before we wrap up, you know, you've dealt in all areas of, of uh, fraud and forensic investigations. Uh, what are some of the biggest lessons you can impart to business leaders who are listening to this podcast? Yeah, uh, it's, pre it's pretty simple, really. Um, trust your gut instinct and don't let it go. If you're feeling it, that something's wrong, something is wrong until proven otherwise. Um, secondly, if it's too good to be true, it absolutely, absolutely is too good to be true because um, money just doesn't fall out of trees. Mm -hmm. So don't be sucked into the story, um, the justification, the mitigation, etc. If it's too good to be true, it is too good to be true. Thirdly would be... Um, you, you have to have a level of trust and accountability within your organisation, but you absolutely have to expect that it's going on right underneath your nose mm. and you're not just finding it. So set the controls, do the monitoring and do the groundwork to build the culture, the systems, the controls to give yourself the best chance of, of protection. Uh, and then lastly, whether you like it or not, there's not a not a not a, a a lot of time for to plan for these reputational events because of social media. Everyone knows before you know, and you're effectively getting briefed at the same time when things are on Twitter, the front page of the paper, mm. etc. So really think and test: How would we respond as an organisation if we had an adverse event? What would we do? Who would we call? Who would our advisors be, etc.? And that's really relevant for the not-for-profits in the charity space. Mm. No one wants to be associated with a charity that's got um, contentious issues that are reputational, true or untrue, out in the market. Mm. How would you reassure that you, you know your, your givers, your followers, etc., to enhance and protect your brand in the in in the likelihood of an event? So preparation, practice, and thought is key because it will happen. Thanks, Cam. Now, before we wrap up, we've got the fast five questions for you. Are you ready for this? Sure. Cam, what was your first job? Working at a news agency for my mum and dad. What's something interesting that's not on your CV? Uh, I'm a twin uh, and I've also got a twin brother and sister. My older brother and sister are also twins, so two sets of twins in the family. You are the very first person I have known. It, it's, it's exceptionally rare, isn't it? Very. Okay, I feel privileged to know that. And now we're going to share this, but I feel privileged to know that. What advice would you give your 18-year-old self? Play the, play the long game, not the short-term game. Um, gathering experience along the way is, is a journey and you have good days and bad days, but as long as you're learning, you know, you get to where you want to be and just have some patience. And I didn't have patience, but I wish I did because the career path is there, the support mm. is there, the mentoring is there. Just play the long game and be around and protect yourself for a longer time than expecting everything now and pushing too hard. What book is a must read or what movie is a must watch? Oh, it's definitely got to be the Blues Brothers, hasn't it? I mean, 
I watched it 30 years ago and I watched it last weekend in lockdown. It lifts the mood. Those guys are pretty cool. And, you know, every time I watch it, there's an underlying theme or something comes out that you haven't seen no matter how many times you've seen it. Yeah, I'll, I'll probably check it out, actually. I, I need I need an uplifting movie like that uh, at the that's moment terrific. right now. What's a job for the future that doesn't exist today? Oh, that's that's a tough one, a tough one. You know, it, without being, being too silly, probably, you know, psychology for robots or, or AI machines that are working too hard because that, that's the future. Everything's going to be driven and automated by technology. Um, look, I, I, I don't know. It, it, it might be space space travel, um, public public uh, taxis around airlines and helicopters you're seeing a bit of. I don't know. But whatever it is, I don't think anyone's going to predict it because it's so dynamic, things are changing so quickly. We can't predict the future, but it will present uh, and we'll see what happens. Cam, you've been amazing today. Thank you so much for being a guest on the HR Think Tank. Kai, absolute pleasure. Thank you. Our guest today was Cam Jackson from EY. He has extensive experience dealing with the C-suite, advising on sensitive and complex matters, including dispute analysis, expert opinion on accounted related matters, significant investigations, bribery and corruption experience for Australian multinationals with operations and exposure offshore, and global regulatory and investigative matters. You can connect with Cam on LinkedIn or visit EY's website for more information about their services. Thanks for listening to the HR Think Tank with Kai no. We'd love it if you could subscribe and share our podcast with your network. As always, the resources and links mentioned will be included in the show notes and posted on the Verify Now website, verifynow.com.au.